This is a production of Cornell University. I'm Michelle Moody Adams. I'm a professor of philosophy in the Arts College and director of, the, of Cornell's program on ethics and public life. And I'm also vice provost for undergraduate education. And it's in that capacity that I am delighted to be able to welcome you to this afternoon's talk, Science Education in the 21st Century, by Professor Carl Wyman. Dr. Wyman's talk is the inaugural public event marking the recent creation of Cornell's new Center for Teaching Excellence, so we're especially excited to have everyone here for this occasion. The talk is also an important reminder of Cornell's longstanding interests in science education and in the special challenges thereof. Some of you may remember, for instance, um, a fall 2006 lecture uh, in which um, Professor Eric Mazur from Harvard University talked about his, con his work, um, research focused changes in his course that led him to be a converted lecturer. He, he called that, that uh, talk Conf Confessions of a Converted Lecturer. Now I know that this afternoon our audience includes not only faculty members from Cornell, but also Cornell graduate student teaching assistants, and as well as teachers from local high schools and possibly middle schools. And so we're delighted to welcome such a diverse audience of scholars and teachers to this afternoon's talk. Um, in the coming weeks, the Center for Teaching Excellence, along with the new Teaching Excellence Institute in our College of Engineering, will be co-sponsoring some discussion luncheons to encourage some follow-up work that will draw on the implications of Dr. Wyman's talk today. Um, if you have not had a chance to do so, you can pick up one of these blue sheets that will describe the events. One will be um, a luncheon for faculty members um, that will take place on Tuesday, September 30th, 11.45 to 1.30, and the other will be a special event for graduate student teaching assistants that will take place on October 2nd um, from 12 noon to 1.30. Again, there are more details on this, uh, on this handout. So now, please welcome Peter Lepage, Professor of Physics and the Harold Tanner Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, who will introduce our speaker this afternoon. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. I will uh, keep this uh, introduction very brief. Carl Wyman is an extremely distinguished uh, physicist. Uh, winner of the 2001 Nobel Prize in Physics for his work uh, in creating uh, Bose-Einstein condensates, which is a very uh, strange form of matter that uh, happens when you cool things down to extremely low temperatures, much lower than outer space. In fact, I was going to say that it was the coldest place in the universe, except there could be a smarter Carl Wyman on another planet that made it even colder when he did it. Uh, but we're not here uh, to hear Carl be, uh, in his capacity as, as Nobel Prize winner of, in physics, but rather uh, because he has uh, for many years been heavily involved in work, research, and innovations in teaching physics to broad physics and now science more broadly to a broad range of, of students. And uh, uh, he's... Uh, uh, created uh, a physics education technology program that created educational online interactive simulations, but also studied how effective they were uh, in actually educating people. He's done research on student beliefs about physics, on problem solving skills. Uh, he's the recipient of the National Science Foundation's uh, Distinguished Teaching Scholar Award in 2001, the Car Carnegie, Carnegie Foundation's US University Professor of the Year Award in 2004 and the American Association of Physics Teachers Orsted Medal in 2007. Uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and chairs the Academy Board on Science Education. Uh, I was particularly interested in having Carl come because he uh, heads two major initiatives in science teaching, science education initiatives, one at Colorado, University of Colorado, one at UBC. Uh, these are initiatives that are spending um, literally millions of dollars on the improvement of science uh, uh, curricula, science teaching. And for me, I was very interested in understanding uh, 
uh, how one productively spends millions of dollars on this subject. And uh, it's very rewarding to go and visit their website and actually get a sense of how they do it. So with no further comment, I uh, give you Carl Wine. Thank you. Uh, what Peter didn't say is we were graduate classmates together and shared a house together. And I was always very annoyed during that period how I would be slaving away doing these long problem sets. And he would sort of start the night before. You know, We'd all been working for three days. And he'd, oh gosh, 10 o'clock at night, I better get started. And then he'd whip it off in a few hours. And, but I'm very relieved hearing him talk about his work here, that being dean, he's finally having to start to work for a living. So uh, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about, uh, about really taking a scientific approach to, to teaching science. And I think what I have to say actually applies to many other subjects as well. And as you'll see, I'll try and link these ideas to to basic understanding of how people learn. But I'm going to stick to the, the context of science because A, that's what I know the best, and B, that's where we've got the most data really showing uh, these, demonstrating these ideas. And I, I also want to apologize at the beginning because there's a kind of delicate balance here that's very hard to optimize between trying to keep things as general so one can see how there's fundamental ideas that apply in many different courses and you know educational levels that it, that would be so relevant to the diverse groups of people I have here and yet try and give you specific ex uh, examples to really understand how these really play out and I there's no real perfect solution to this so I apologize ahead of time but you can understand sort of the tension now uh, before I start, though, I want to make sure that you don't think you should pay attention to this because I have a Nobel Prize. Uh, turns out you get a Nobel Prize, you become an expert on everything, including education, no matter how little you actually know about the subject. Um, you know, that's for doing physics research. The reason you should pay attention to this is that uh, everything I say here is backed up by lots of data. This comes from... Uh, researchers and actually in a whole variety of fields, as you'll see, from all over the world. Um, and, but a little bit of what I'm going to talk about actually comes from my own science education research group that I've had now for 12 or 13 years. And you can see lots of people who have been working in that. So what I'm going to cover today is first briefly talk about why science education is important today. And then some, what research tells us about expert thinking in science and the effectiveness of different uh, teaching approaches at accomplishing that. And then I'll move on to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, how one actually implements these research-based principles of learning in actual teaching. And then just spend a moment at the end uh, mentioning, it, as Peter talked about, these science education initiatives that I'm leading. So the, uh, historically, science education was really about uh, training this tiny fraction of the population that was going to go on to become the next generation of scientists and engineers. But over the past half century or so, there's been some big societal changes that have really changed the, the needs and purposes of science education. And there's really two of them. The first is that uh, we've come, we mankind has come facing these enormously important global scale issues, which are fundamentally technical at their heart. And so we have to have a, a technically literate population if they're going to make wise decisions on some very critical questions you know, involving things like global warming and environmental change and genetic modification and so on. And then the second reason is the economy. Uh, the modern economy is so based on science and technology that really pretty much independent of occupation, a person will be more successful if they have some basic 
technical literacy and complex problem solving skills. And so because of these, these changes, um, what it means is that we, of course, can't neglect the next generations of scientists, but we also really have to think about making science education effective and relevant for a large fraction of the entire population. And so that's really a much larger and in some ways more important purpose. Now, I'm sure that it's going to occur to you through this talk of, okay, are we busy going to have to make trade-offs there between the you know, training scientists versus this broader population? And, and I can talk more details in question period if you want, but all the research is showing us that there's no trade-off at all. If we do a better job at the one goal, we'll also do better at the other we'll have more and, and better scientists as well. Okay, so I've said we need to have an effective education for a large <coughs> fraction of the population. What do I mean by effective here? And what I would argue an effective education is really changing how students think. So they, they come into our classrooms like this, and we want to have them go out transform. See, that was easy. Um, now, you know, realistically, we don't really expect them to all turn into scientists like these two, but I would say that the, the relevant, the basic goal at, you know, at every course and every, over a program should be to have them in each step of the way, students come to think about and use science more like a scientist does. And that's really the, the measure I'm going to use when I look at how well we're doing and how we uh, might improve. And, you know, having them think about science like a scientist, can, is it really possible to accomplish this for most students, like I'm saying we, needed, we need? And what I and many others are arguing is that it is possible, but it really requires us to take a different approach to to science education. We have to start thinking of the teaching of science very much like science itself. And to illustrate what I mean, I'm going to pick four basic tools or practices that are really at the heart of any experimental science program. And a big part, I'd argue, of, of why science is advancing so rapidly and successfully over the last couple of centuries. The, the first is that, you know, guide what one does by fundamental principles that come out of research. In the, in the context of, of education, that means principles of how people learn. Uh, take the practices of what we do based on good data and standards of evidence, not tradition and anecdote or even sometimes superstition as is too often used in science teaching. And third is disseminate, you know, after you've measured what works, disseminate the results in a, in a scholarly fashion. And so as one's coming into a new area, you can learn about and copy what works and continually build from there rather than reinventing each, you know, each time some new person's coming in to teach something. And then, of course, fully utilizing modern technology. And as I say, these are, the, these are completely taken for granted in, in scientific research, and I'd argue that we really ought to have them in being used in science teaching in the same way. And so the rest of my talk is really going to try and support this way of thinking about uh, teaching science. So before I get into a bunch of research studies and results, uh, though I, I want to frame this a little bit by giving a, a perspective of how I came to think about teaching science in a very different way. And it goes back to, okay, you know, how did I start? Well, you know, when I was first called upon to teach physics many decades ago, um, I used what I think is kind of a basic human re reaction to the, ever teaching anything, which is that I'd go off and I'd go off and think, I thought about the subject, I think it was introductory electricity, you know, really hard so I could get it figured out in my own mind really clearly so that I could then go and explain it uh, 
to the students so they could understand the same clarity I had. Well, that was the idea anyway, but I've always been a really hardcore experimentalist, and so I would measure what they were really getting out of this. And it was, uh, it was clear that my brilliantly clear uh, <laughs> explanations were leaving uh, most of the students really quite baffled. And when I measured somewhat subtly, some of my colleagues, the students, they really weren't doing much better. And so for a long time, this was just a, a frustrating puzzle to me. But the way I came to make some progress was actually by looking at my graduate students. Now, I had a, I had a quite big, successful atomic physics program for many, many years. And so I spent a lot of time paying attention to the development uh, of my graduate students and how they, seeing how they progressed. And I came to see a very consistent pattern that emerged. Um, and that is that students would come into my work in my lab and, you know, they were, by definition, they'd had 17 years of great success in science classes, otherwise they wouldn't have been coming to work in my lab. Um, but when they'd start to, to work in research, they were really basically pretty clueless about how to actually do physics. Well, but then the, here's really kind of the surprising thing is student after student after student, though, after just a few years of working in the lab, they were suddenly expert physicists. They were winning arguments with me all the time. Now, you know, if I... If, the first few you see this and you think, oh, that's just kind of curious that that student's like that. But as I came to see this happening over and over, I realized, no, there's something more basic going on. This isn't a characteristic of individual. There's some fundamental pattern here. And I really wanted to try and figure out, you know, get the bottom. Could you make sense of this? Now, you know, one hypothesis that occurred to me, and I think has occurred to many others who've seen the same thing happen, is, well, you know, maybe the human brain just has to go through sort of a 17-year caterpillar stage <laughs> before it can <laughs> blossom into a, you know, physicist butterfly. Um, but I, you know, I took a little more rigorous approach to this and really started to systematically look at research on how people learn, and how, particularly in science, to see if I could understand this pattern. And what I came to realize is that, okay, wasn't the, the bu caterpillar to butterfly wasn't the explanation, but then in fact this pattern uh, and, and change here did make sense. And in understanding it, it also convinced me that there was tremendous opportunity to improve uh, the learning of, uh, by students in regular courses. And so I'm going, um, and, and this was really based upon looking at, at the, the research and particularly the major advances in the past decade or two that across these three rather different areas of bring from cognitive psychology to basic brain research, to classroom studies, particularly in the university science college and university science classes, there was a very consistent picture between all this research that told us really what was important about achieving learning. And so I'm going to try and, and give you a few samples of that to sort of how I came to uh, think about this in a very different way and how to think about teaching in a very different way. And so I'm going to start by looking at some examples of research first on the ideas about what's been seen about how experts uh, think and learn, and then research on traditional science teaching and how well its uh, students are, how well it's teaching expert thinking, and then some on research showing us how to do better. And uh, okay, so. It turns out cognitive psychologists have done a lot of studies of expertise. And they find that over a very wide range of, of discipline, academic disciplines, and even actually some athletic activities, playing chess, etc., um, 
there's certain, a few very common consistent characteristics of experts. Uh, the first one's no great surprise. Experts have a lot of factual knowledge in their area of expertise. But the others aren't so obvious. Uh, it turns out that experts have a unique organ mental organizational framework for the information that's consistent across that discipline that allows them to, to, to very effectively retrieve and apply their knowledge. And this is based on certain kind of, you know, expert like recognition of patterns, associations, connections, etc., cetera, um, which in the scientific uh, domain usually well, not all, I mean, part of that in scientific domain is really what we think about as scientific concepts. That's a way that experts have taken a, a vast amounts of different kinds of information and fit it together in a broad framework that allows them to use that information to, and apply it in certain ways very effectively. Now, a third characteristic of experts is they have an ability to monitor their own thinking and learning, at least in their discipline of expertise. And so they, they're able to ask themselves, you know, do I understand this? Does this make sense? Am I learning this right? How can I check that? And I think uh, many teachers actually who've developed this, and certainly it was true in my case, just kind of assume that's something that people do and it isn't, okay? Uh, both of these, these organizational you know, frameworks and this monitoring thinking are very much acquired expertise. And I think implicit in traditional science teaching is the idea that, well, we give them the knowledge and they've either got, they've already have these other things or it kind of comes along automatically. But that's really, not what the cognitive psychology tells us. Uh, that work says that these things uh, are developed, they require many hours of intense effort uh, and practice to develop them with appropriate guidance and reflection. Um, in fact, to, to reach a high level of expertise in pretty much anything uh, takes many thousands of hours of intense effort. And I, Sorry for students who find that depressing to know, but that's the reality. So, um, and I think you can make a pretty good case that this is fundamentally pretty biological in origin, that uh, everything of, we think about as expertise is really stuff that's in the long-term memory. And to develop the long-term memory, you know, you, your brain has to build little proteins and put them in the right structure in the way, and that just is a slow process. It takes a long time, and there's just no basic shortcuts for it. But, you know, what it means is, okay, these things have to be developed if they're going to be uh, acquired. So let me turn now to say, okay, I've late argued that we know certain characteristics of expert thinking, well, look at how well students are actually learning that from traditional science teaching. And by traditional science teaching, I mean the kind of teaching that's, I think, likely familiar to uh, most all of you who've had a science class, as a great majority of science classes work this way, where the primary contact between student and instructor is the instructor standing up like this, lecturing to a largely passive, silent, uh, group of students, and then those students, they go home and they do, you know, back of the chapter problems from the textbook, and they have similar exams that are similar. And so, uh, over the past 20 years, people have been doing a bunch of research on, okay, how, how well is that working? And I'm going to focus on two aspects of this. Um, one is conceptual understanding, mastery. And two is just basic beliefs about uh, physics and equivalently chemistry and really what it is and how to learn it, uh, that, uh, what students, how, how well students are acquiring that from their courses.
Now, it, it turns out in physics, I think probably because we physicists pride ourselves that we got a few basic concepts that are widely applicable. And so uh, physicists have done a lot of research on how well are students really mastering these concepts, particularly in our introductory courses. And in this process of studying this, they developed a number of, of assessment tools that are quite carefully and, uh, tested and validated and so on, that really uh, are quite accurate at measuring the student mastery. And by the oldest and most widely used is something called the, the Force Concepts Inventory. Uh, out of curiosity, how many people here have heard of the Force Concept Inventory? Okay, so only a small fraction. Um, so, well, what this is, is it's something that uh, it takes a subset of the basic concepts of force and motion that are covered in pretty much every first semester physics course taught anywhere. And it, it tests students' understanding of these normally by asking them to uh, apply them to some simple real world situation like car running into a truck or in the, in the question I display here, uh, this is a, a hoop, hoop sitting on a tabletop and a ball's rolling around inside it and what direction does it go when it flies out the end there. And the way this is used is then it's given to students at the, uh, typically, at the start and then at the end of their course that covers this material. And one looks at, okay, what percentage of the questions do they get wrong, not know the answer to at the beginning, that they actually got right at the end? That tells you what percentage that they learned of what they didn't know. And this is now pretty routinely given in hundreds of physics courses every year uh, across the world to measure this learning gain. Now, what's emerged from this is a really kind of remarkable result, which is, uh, and I displayed it with this histogram, but what this is looking at is you take the average over the whole class and you look at what the average uh, amount the student learned, this learning gain. And what one sees, and this is a histogram showing the results from actually uh, this average class from 16 different classes. What you can see here is that in the traditional lecture course, this stu the average student never learns as much as 30% of the concepts that they didn't know when they started the class. And what you see in this data, and I have piles of other data that's unpublished, and they're because usually the, the faculty do worse than what's shown up here and don't want to have it seen in print. Um, but this result shows up independent of lecture quality, class size, institution. Um, in fact, I think in here is Harvard University and a couple of community colleges, and you can see they, they're all in the same boat, that says that this kind of teaching is simply not effective for people learning, uh, developing a basic mastery of concepts. We now have data from, from a variety of other levels, and we have data, similar kinds of data coming in from other disciplines that are giving us this same consistent picture. So this is saying this, I, you know, this expert organization in terms of concepts is not coming through in the traditional approach to teaching science for most students. Um, I will say that partly driven by this as well as other things, people then have worked on different ways to actually teach introductory physics, and I'll talk a little about those later, but they're now pretty consistently coming in with factors of two to three higher uh, you know, learning gains than with the traditional approach. But before I get to that, I'm gonna t I want to turn to a very different aspect of learning. It really doesn't involve the content so much at all. It's this basic beliefs about the subject. And it turns out if you interview lots of people on their beliefs about, say, physics and how it's learned, uh, you'll find that there it lies on a novice to expert scale, where the way I 
the characteristics of novices and experts are that the novice sees the content of physics as just isolated little pieces of information and you learn physics just by memorizing all these little pieces. Uh, this information is just handed down by some arbitrary authority and quite disconnected to the work from the world outside the classroom. And novice problem solving is matching the patterns of the surface features of the problem to certain memorized recipes, okay? And any, most physics professors who'll be nodding their heads at, yeah, they've seen all this. Um, now, experts, like a practicing physicist, they see the, you know, physics is this coherent structure of these very broadly applicable concepts. These concepts describe nature and are established through experiment. And expert problem solving is using these systematic concept-based strategies that looks at much deeper structure and patterns in the situation, which makes them widely applicable, including, you know, into completely new situations and contexts, and therefore much more useful than the, uh, the novice-like approach. So once you understand people's beliefs lie in this, you can develop surveys that actually probe, that it can actually measure them. And this is one thing my own group has done, and probably the most widely used survey now is on this is one that we've developed and tested. And so you can now use this survey just like the force concepts inventory. You can measure your class, what their beliefs are at the beginning of the term, and then you can, you can see, okay, how much more expert-like have they become as a result of taking this introductory physics course. Well, that may be what you'd like to be measuring. Uh, the reality of what we and others who've used this measure now in many, many courses is an introductory, an Virtually all introductory physics courses, actually, except for a couple of experimental ones I'll tell you about, leave the students significantly more novice-like in their beliefs about physics as a result of taking this course than they were before they ever started. Okay? Um, now, if any of you who are laughing are chemists, I'll point out that we've <laughs> recently developed a comparable survey for chemistry, and we see if anything you know, chemistry is as bad or maybe even worse. So, um, okay, so that's a, a, a sort of different aspect of expert-like thinking, but it's telling you that, you know, there's a real problem here with traditional science teaching in terms of what we're accomplishing. And so I want to say, look at, you know, why is this the case? And can we dig a little deeper to here to understand this? And I think... Uh, one part of this problem uh, is that, you know, the, the lectures are presenting information, they're presenting ways to solve problems and so on, and to them, the, you know, they're expert instructors, but the, the relevance and the conceptual underpinnings that are so clear to them are so sort of ingrained uh, that they just are... are you know, can't imagine it's not being obvious to everybody. And I, I talk about this, that psychologists talk about the curse of knowledge, of how incredibly difficult it actually is, once you un know something and mastered it, to understand how somebody doesn't know it, doesn't know anything about it, how they can see that same situation and, and information. And so uh, it's just... That's just an extremely difficult thing to do. And so, to, you know, the same, the, the novice, and presumably most of our students in our courses are pretty novice in the subject, otherwise why would they be taking a class on it? Um, that same presentation to them can, see very can seem very differently. It can actually reinforce their, their perception that, you know, learning that all this is all about a whole bunch of memorizing these facts and recipes, and that they not only never have the opportunity or, or never uh, practice this expert-like thinking, they never even are aware there is such a thing as this kind of different expert-like thinking and, and problem-solving. <clears throat> 
Uh, and then a, a, a second aspect is one that's kind of much more simple and basic, but it's why, uh, you know, why there's a real problem with what happens in a typical lecture class, is the, the limitations on the working memory that are not being uh, properly considered here. And what this is, what I'm referring to here, is something that actually is... Um, a basic element of how the mind works, and it's really nicely represented by this Gary Larson cartoon. Um, this is an extremely well-established result from cognitive science, and it, it, what it says is that the, the part of the memory that deals with, um, with remembering and processing information on short time scales, like what would be relevant to an hour-long science lecture, uh, has extremely limited capacity. That's in contrast to the long-term memory, which has enormous capacity. But this working memory capacity, uh, it's in fact, uh, his, his people say this kind of carefully, and there's a bit of an argument now as to whether the typical human brain can deal with a maximum of seven distinct new items or only four distinct new items, but however you slice it, that's just a tiny amount compared to what almost a student is exposed to in almost any science lecture. And it's also true that the, the way the working memory uh, functions is the more new stuff it gets, the more it kind of slows down and has trouble doing anything. It's a whole lot like a computer with not nearly enough RAM. Uh, but it only has to get up to something in between four and seven, and that's when you get the screen of death, that just nothing more happens, okay? Um, so, you know, if you keep, it's hard to, to really, until you put it in this perspective, to think just how remarkable it is. I mean, you know, that means that some new technical term that student hasn't heard before, even if it gets explained to them, that's just used up, you know, something like 20% of the working memory that they have for that whole class period, you know. So, so it's really pretty dramatic here. Uh, I'd say since all of you have human brains, and I'm pretty confident they work much like this, um, and I'm going to be pushing your limits here, I will make sure my PowerPoint slides are available so you can go back on where I exceeded your working memory and review. Uh, sort of artificial long-term memory here. Um, but what this means is that the, the amount of processing and retention from the typical lecture is really tiny just because of these basic limitations. I want to emphasize that's very much the case just for novices. This is a very expertise-dependent thing, and it's because anything, if you know more about the subject, then you've, the, the stuff they're talking about is more calling on stuff that's in your long-term memory and you don't need to use up short-term memory for it. And frankly, I'm assuming in this audience that most people here have, have thought about or are familiar with many of the general issues that I'm talking about. Otherwise, I know that, that once I'm a third of the way through, it's kind of gibberish beyond that. But hopefully, many of you are in that category. Anyway, uh, so it's really easy to confirm this, uh, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples of two very simple studies that anybody, any instructor who had a strong stomach could repeat themselves. Um, the, the first is from Joe Reddish, who's a uh, physics professor at University of Maryland, and this actually was and is considered one of their outstanding lecturers. But he's also a very thoughtful guy, and he knows about physics education research. In fact, he's in that field now. And so he started really worrying about measuring what his students were learning. And so he just hired a graduate student to stand outside the door and at the end of the lecture, randomly grab students and then interview them about, ask him, you know, what was the lecture you just heard about? And what he found is consistently the students could give only the vaguest of generalities in, in response to that question. Um, in a little study that Kathy Perkins and I did, we just took um, 
we would take them, you know, out of examples out of the middle of the lecture of some significant but non-obvious fact present in lecture and then test them 15 minutes later what fraction actually remembered that. And we typically got numbers like about 10%. Um, and there's many, many other studies that show you quite comparable things about how little a, you know, a novice in a subject can really get out of listening from a, to an hour-long lecture unless there's a whole bunch of very special things done. So it's, I'm just taking kind of the traditional situation. Uh, there are ways you can make lectures effective. I'm just looking at the typical case here. Um, okay, so getting back to the puzzle that got me into this in the first place with graduate students, you can now see how all of this actually makes very good sense, that these, these students were doing great in these classes, but those classes were really not teaching them expert-like thinking in physics. But when they got into the research lab, in fact, they were doing exactly what we know is now necessary for developing expert-like thinking. They were very strenuously engaged in thinking about the physics of situation, thinking about the associations, the patterns, applying information um, continually and getting guiding feedback to sort of uh, coach them in that thinking. And so it wasn't anything magical about the atmosphere of the research lab. It was simply the cognitive processes that they were spending all their time in there compared to the cognitive processes they'd been using in their classes. And that's really the explanation for the difference here. And it also says, gee, so why don't we get those cognitive processes into all the classrooms and students will do a lot better. And that's exactly what lots of people, uh, particularly in physics education, have been doing on that. And so I'm going to sort of turn to, OK, so how do you do that? And what really do you have to build in to make sure people learn? And it's, I mean, it's, it's a pretty straightforward process. Now, easy is not, straightforward does not mean easy. There's a lot of work involved. But you, you can really argue, approach this a very scientific way. We've got certain principles. And if you get those in, you know, you follow those, you'll get just mo a, the great majority of really what matters here from the few principles I'm going to give you. And these are all coming out of lots of different people's research. Uh, the first is learning is always built on prior thinking. You know, it's the, you're changing a brain and it starts out in a certain condition. You, to be effective, you ab teaching you absolutely have to connect up appropriately with the students' prior thinking and understanding. Um, secondly, there's got to be an, an explicit, you know, they've got to see what expert thinking is like and they've got to explicitly practice it for an extended period of time and at a very strenuous level. We know that's required for really developing this level of expertise. In fact, uh, people who study the brain have, have in recent years come to recognize it's much more like a brain development is much more like a muscle uh, than they used to think in that, you, you know, it's obvious everybody knows that if I want to build up a muscle, I got to go exert it strenuously and I got to do that over and over for a long period of time. People now recognize the brain is very, develops in very much the same way. And so, you know, you've got to have that kind of, of strenuous, intense focus of, therefore, engagement and thinking about it. And you've got to have effective feedback to guide, you know, just thinking about something doesn't work. You've got to be guided to do that in a, an effective way. And we know that to be effective, feedback has to be timely, namely right when they're thinking about it, and it's got to be specific. So it's quite you know, it's quite specific to, to give them useful guidance on this. And, but that's a whole lot of work. I talked about all this, uh, you know, extended strenuous effort. Human beings evolved a long time ago to have sense enough not to put in a whole lot of effort on something unless there's some 
clear reason to do that. And so uh, that comes into motivation. People simply, you know, you've, you've got to motive, people have to be motivated, in order to learn, they've got to be motivated to put in this kind of in, 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 uh, strenuous effort. And then there's some littler things here. You've got to worry about these limitations on working memory and kinds of the details of what you work with. Uh, and then I'll point out one almost, well, it's not trivial, it's just such clear, straightforward, but it's not often very used, is, okay, we also worry about retention. Basic information and processes, people know exactly how to have that retained. We don't, you know, and, and there's no secret about it at all. You have to have a uh, person that has to go through spaced, repeated retrieval and application of the ideas and, and processes. And you've got to build connections to other things. If you do that, it gets retained. If you don't, it doesn't get retained, period. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, OK, so what I'm in the interest of time, rather than you know these other things I've grayed out now, are relatively straightforward to think how one can apply in a particular course or context. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about two and three here in a little more detail, though, where it may not be so quite so obvious. Um, motivation has been studied a lot, uh, and uh, I, you know, a few basic things. First, you got to realize it's a pretty complicated subject. It depends on people's previous experience, culture, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and, but some things we do know from, and this actually comes from st some studies from my own group, um, is that in terms of learning science, a key element in seeing that it's interesting, and therefore that's a big part of motivation, is being interested to learn it, is seeing relevance uh, or usefulness. We, we do a lot of surveying and we've got now thousands and thousands of responses to students as to what made their increase in a particular area of science, uh, what enhanced their interest. And it's overwhelmingly that they saw how this could be useful or relevant to something they didn't know about before. So, uh, so that's a, a big part. And that means you you really have to present things in meaningful context if people are going to see they're interested, uh, interesting. Um, there's an important, uh, you know, big aspect in motivation is a person has to have a sense that they can master a subject and also the, beyond that, a better sense of the process by which they need to go through to master the subject. Both those are pretty, quite relevant to motivation. Um, and then a, a, a sense of, especially if you might have somebody work really hard at something, a, a sense of sort of personal control or some level of choices involved in it that uh, they're responsible for. Also, this clearly identified with motivation. Now, I, I might say before I leave this that I run into a certain number of faculty, and probably they're not in this room, but who argue what you know, gosh, by the time students come to college, I shouldn't be worrying about, you know, having to motivate them, tell them this is interesting, they should know all that. Uh, you know, that should have happened when they were 13 years old. And the only thing I can, you know, say in response to that is, well, if it didn't happen when they were 13 years old, and it only happens when they're 13 years old, if they happen to be awfully lucky into where you know, what socioeconomic class they were raised, who their relatives were, who talked to them about science or whatever. If they didn't get that, then if you don't worry about motivation, you might as well just write them off because they, there's no reason, you know, there's nothing genetic about an interest in physics. It's developed and if you want your students to learn it, you better convince them that they should be motivated to do why it's, uh, worth learning. Um, okay, but you motivated them now, and so what you motivate them to do is really practice expert-like thinking, and that means getting them engaged and then monitoring and guiding that thinking. And what we know about 
acquiring that is mean is that people have to go through a series of ongoing, more increasingly difficult tasks where each one is, is challenging for them, but it's doable. And so they're, these are tasks they're thinking about working on and, and, uh, and completing. And it, it's really important that one explicitly focus on these, on these expert-like ways of thinking, which aren't obvious at all if you're not an expert. And I've talked a lot about the, you know, the idea of concepts, how things are related. That means how in developing this, they have to be tasks that really call upon them to, to explore relationships and associations between different pieces of information, different phenomena, etc. Working on on sorting out what's relevant and irrelevant information in a certain situation for solving a problem. That's things, experts are really good at that, but it's a very much acquired uh, expertise. It's gotta, there's got to be a, a, a quite explicit focus on this kind of metacognitive processing of experts, the, the self-checking, the saying, is, am I making sense here? Um, and then finally, the, the reflection on learning. The, the, am I learning this in a sensible way? How does this fit in with the things I've learned before? How much do I have to modify them, et cetera? All of these things are developed through practice, uh, but have to be part of that practice. And you need to give students to learn. You've got to give them tasks that, that quite explicitly have them do this. And when the data says that when they do this, they get a lot better at it. Um, okay, so I told you I told you what you need to do, and I think most thoughtful instructors dealing with one or two, maybe three students could probably do that reasonably well. But it's been a long time since I had a class of three students, um, and I've been teaching classes of 200 plus students for some time. And so the question is, how do you do this with a very you know typical large class? And what I would argue is, is actually more than about five students, uh, you really have to look to technology. That um, here's a place where technology can be a big help. In fact, I'd, personally, I'd argue that it's probably essential to be using technology to make this work. And I'm going to talk about a couple of different technologies. Um, well, no, I'm not. The first, I'm, I'm going to really talk about just the highly interactive lecture as supported by clickers. The other technology, if I had more time, interact, these interactive simulations, I think I'll skip because of time today. Um, so how many people here are familiar with using clickers? OK, so most of you, but not all. So a clicker is basically a personal response system. Um, they're often there, they're about two or three times bigger than this laser pointer. Every student has one. And the way they work is that in my class, uh, for example, I would ask these introductory physics students um, this question about, OK, this basic con conceptual question about what happens when the light bulb, to the brightness light bulb, when the switch is closed. The, the students' clickers have a series of buttons on them. Usually I bring one to show up, but I forgot to bring it on this trip. Um, sitting on the table right over there. Oh, perfect. In fact, it's even the kind I'm familiar with. Um, yeah, so it's got these buttons on it. The students think about this question. I might have them talk to the few of their neighbors uh, to, before they answer, and then They'll push the button that they think corresponds to the answer they think's right. I've got a receiver on my computer. It picks up, because these things are coded, it picks up who that student was and what answer they chose. And then usually after every, all the answers are in, uh, one displays to the class a histogram of all the results. Now, this is a um, technology that um, the initiatives I work with have been doing a lot of work on uh, helping faculty use them and a lot of studies about how they can and can't be used effectively. And so we've got a bunch of data on this, which we're busy 
slowly publishing, but in the meantime, we've written a pretty extensive guide uh, on details about how to use these things most effectively that's on our website if you want it. Uh, but just a few brief things I'll say about this. First is, like all technologies, this isn't automatically helpful. One ha really has to think about what you want to accomplish as a teacher and how this can support you in accomplishing that. And we've seen many cases where they're basically just used as a expensive way to take attendance and test the students a lot and the students are pretty grumpy about that and probably it's not very educationally useful they're grumpy particularly because they got to pay money for these things um, but when they're used and perceived to be used really to enhance this kind of engagement and communication and useful feedback then they really can be quite transformative in a lecture hall um, and some of the some of the key elements we've seen to make this happen is partly is just the attitude of the instructor, but a few details. First, it's important to have challenging questions. Oftentimes, questions are made too easy. Usually, good to have them focusing on these deeper conceptual issues. Student-student um, discussion, uh, like peer the peer instruction, like Eric Mazur talked about when he was here last year, um, I'm sure, um, is, is a, a really valuable part of this. And it's valuable both in the learning that takes place in the discussion, but also the, the feedback. Students get a lot of feedback just from talking to each other that can be a lot more specific than anything you can do with a 200-person class. But you do, as an instructor, need to follow up on the discussion with, to be as most effective feedback as you can. Um, in fact, I've gone so far in my classes to actually have assigned discussion groups. So each four people here will actually, on these questions, for certain questions, they've got to come to a consensus before they actually answer. And so they're all busy discussing these questions. What that's really useful, as well as what's useful for them, the way it's really useful for an instructor is you can wander around and listen to those discussions. And then you not only have the, the information about student thinking from seeing what that histogram is, but you can, you've listened in. You know very specific things that they're having trouble with, questions, what they understand, and in the follow-up discussion, you can bring those out and therefore make this much more specific and therefore much more useful uh, feedback to students uh, afterwards. Does that mean I'm running too long? <laughs> Boy, this is a tough uh, place here. What? The clicker did it. The clicker did it? My. <laughs> OK. Um, so I better move along quickly here. Um, so you've done all this. Your classroom is incredibly interactive, and, and they're practicing expert thinking. It's not enough, OK? And I emphasize this because a lot of really thoughtful instructors put a tremendous amount of time thinking about preparing what's going to go on in class. They don't put much time at all, and you know, they just say do problems 5 through 15, the back of the chapter. Um, and that's really a mistake. And the reason it's a mistake is back at this issue of basic biology. There's no way in the time that students have in your classroom, no matter what they're doing, to really develop long-term memory enough. They've got to have more time, and that means that you really have to send them out of the classroom to spend many more hours practicing this expert-like thinking that means designing good, authentic homework problems that give them further practice in that and, f and find ways to get them effective develop, uh, feedback on what they do. Okay, so the interactive simulations, we're skipping because I'm running too late. Um, okay, so I'll just start finishing up here. So I've been, you know, pushing all along my needs that can take this kind of scientific approach using basic principles to actually improve instruction, but it's also really important that we do rigorous measurements of, of how things are working. So I'm going to give you some data of 
what sort of things we and others see when putting those things into, into practice. So, and I'm going to just take the particular examples of where I already presented data to you. The retention of information from lecture, okay, which I don't really want to argue as a particularly important thing anyway, but we have just, you know, looking at how to make it work, we get enormous improvements in that when we work on it. Um, more important things like the conceptual understanding, uh, as I already mentioned before, there's two to three times improvements now getting pretty routine. And in these beliefs about uh, physics and problem solve, you know, what it means to learn and solve problems in physics, uh, this is a much newer area. And so uh, it's only been a few years we've had the tools to measure it and start understanding what was relevant. So in the very early uh, kind of minor interventions, we found that we could at least pretty easily get rid of these significant drops, but it's only been uh, actually in this past summer, I've been very happy to see uh, reports uh, come out of some a couple of new experimental courses where they didn't do drastic things to the content, but by really carefully understanding and tailoring it to address these student concepts, we now, for the first time, have two demonstration examples. It is possible, actually, to, within a single physics course to make substantial improvements. In other words, to have students think about this learning physics in a much more expert-like way. So that's uh, just more data showing this really can work. Um, OK, so just finish up here with uh, talking about, OK, got these big, great ideas. How do we actually make them widespread in every university classroom? And I think it's clear that it really requires sort of changing the culture and the thinking about education, starting with the major research uh, universities like here. And you've got to work at the department level. And that's really what these initiatives that I'm leading are doing. Um, and they're going through and providing a bunch of resources and a bunch of incentives to have departments go in it in a systematic scientific way to go through all their main undergraduate courses and figure out, okay, what are the real goals we want students to be able to do after the successfully completing these courses? Let's develop good, rigorous, objective measures of how they're succeeding, and then putting into practice either tested best practices or developing new practices guided by these principles of learning uh, and measure that they work in this kind of systematic way. And I'm quite optimistic that if we can get educators to really approach teaching science in this scientific way, the results are both be dramatic improvements in student learning, but also in the same way scientific research has become a very efficient process because we don't have to copy things. We learn so much from each other. We'll also make teaching more efficient. And, and in that spirit, we're making sure that all the materials, <laughs> tools, data we develop are all going to be uh, accessible on the web. As Peter says, we already have some of things there. Uh, OK, so I'll just end with this, that I think this, we need a much better approach to, to education, and this scientific approach provides it. Um, and if you want to learn more about these ideas, uh, just some good references, starting the, this NAS book on how people learn. Uh, that's sort of the longest and most well-written, and they work their way down to the shortest and worst written by me. Um, and then also, if, you, if you're interested in more, some more details on the research, the, the CLAS site here actually is, is where my own group has these surveys and a lot of the uh, research papers based on that. Uh, so thank you, and I gather there's supposed to be a bunch of time for questions, arguments, discussion now, right? Sure, I'm happy to handle questions. If they start throwing things, you might need to intervene, but yeah. My wife is a speech therapist, and she 
she describes encountering a recurrent problem with many of her students that she relates as being ready to fire, whoops, aim. And I see the same kinds of things in my students as well. And in part, I think this might derive from a, a sense that we have instilled that they have to give an answer very quickly. Um, and that's certainly reinforced by exams that have to be done in a limited amount of time. Where does this fit in? Uh, yeah, yeah. So he, if you couldn't hear him in the back, he's wondering about these, uh, the tendency for students to try, ha, feel they have to give an immediate answer and the way this exams might reinforce this. So yeah, there's a couple of things I can say. First, that's very much a, a, a novice problem idea about problem solving that namely you you have memorized answers and so that means if you know it it's something you respond immediately that's the answer that that re answering something solving something is not a reasoning process that might take some time okay um, so that's yeah that's something that they've they've learned through bad teaching essentially or mis misinterpreted teaching is really better than than bad uh, but one of the ways exams really aggravate this is that um, in the problem-solving research literature, we talk about exercises versus problems. A problem is something that you don't know how to get this. You don't know the solution. You, have, you can reason your way through to it using certain approaches, but you can't just give the answer. An exercise is something that you've worked 50 problems that look just like this. And so you, it just, you know, I give it to you and your expert brain, uh, this is actually quite literally true, your expert brain just goes right to this one little place where information's stored. It doesn't have to activate any of these broader control things. And that, that clicks out, here's the answer, okay? And, Functional MRI will show that it activates just a little tiny part of your brain doing that. Now, when we give exams to students, um, most of the time, they, you can only get through a typical uh, university exam in time if you're doing those as exercises. In other words, you've practiced and practiced and practiced so many times that that's just an automatic thing. You don't actually have time to go through the reasoning process, and very few exams ask you to go through the reasoning process. And so exams actually really, you know, when we talk about them getting more novice-like, that's you've just put your finger on some of the, on some key elements of, of how, why that's happening, okay? Uh, in back? Yeah. Uh. You mentioned that the um, short-term memory can only accommodate uh, four to seven items, but the totality of the items that one on the list of a physics curriculum divided by the number of uh, class days is certainly more than that. So can you elaborate on exactly what one does about this? Um. Right, so it's, it's vastly more, and particularly when you start including the number of technical terms alone, without any understanding beyond a technical jargon, probably it, it, it hits the limit. So one has to think very carefully about what you can do. You can't eliminate, you know, cognitive load, demands on long-term memory, but you can think very carefully about about how to minimize, how to eliminate unnecessary cognitive load. And so, um, so one thing is you just have to be realistic about what people can cover. The second thing is um, you, have to, you have to recognize that, okay, if I want to cover these things, students ought to be able to learn something outside of class. And so, um, and certainly there's a whole bunch of information that they can learn because what I talked about with working memory limits, those are within time constrained values. If it's something that somebody can read the book and think, think about and work backwards and go through slowly, then, then it, you don't have those same constraints. So 
So the best thing to do is say, okay, look, realistically, this is what can be accomplished in a class. I either have to leave out some topics or have them learn them on their own independently, which isn't such a bad thing anyway. But things you can do literally in the class, uh, you just think about everything that takes, that takes mental processing. Okay? And so I'll give you a couple of quick examples. I already talked about jargon. Uh, you know, don't use it. Introduce it outside of class. They got to learn about it. You know, or if you want to use it, if you want to introduce some technical term in class, think about, gee, is that really 20% of what I want them to learn today? Usually, it's not. Um, but other other examples are um, that demand, you know, working memory are when there's a process or an image where you just say it in words and they've got to use their brain to think about what that shows. If you just give a simple ske visual sketch of it, uh, it dramatically reduces the working memory demands. Um, if the organizational structure is very clear and so they see how different things relate together, uh, then they, that means those things can get chunked. Uh, that's the technical term. <laughs> and so, so if they see that this is very intimately related to this, the same idea, then that takes up half as much working memory as if you didn't take that extra step to make sure they saw how they all fit together and so they saw them as separate ideas. So those are, those are a few of the elements, actually. I've got a whole bunch of specifics in my slides that I never got to, but uh, that's, you know, that you talk about a big issue and, a sm and small issues that come into this. You mentioned outside learning. Um, how do you feel about pre-learning versus, like, getting into reading before they come to lecture versus after they're in lecture and going back? Do you try and have pre-reading? Um, I require pre-reading, and it's just for the issues of working memory is, you know, what the, if, if you think about, if you think about what instructor, the unique thing an instructor can provide to a student, okay, um, reading a textbook is not, uh, they can actually do that without you standing up there and in one form or another reading it to them. And so, and so what I would argue is the most efficient use of this precious resource an expensive resource of professorial time is, is, should involve the minimum of just giving them basic information. So you should think about the basic information they need in preparation for the class, and they should be expected to read that, maybe even tested briefly on it. But then in class time, they're spending all their time thinking about this processing and applying that information in these kind of expert-like tasks and so on. Now, in the, in the process of doing that, there's going to be many questions come up that get at the basic ideas that, okay, they read it, but they didn't really understand it. But now you're giving, you're fitting that information into a framework and a structure and they see where it's needed, then they absorb it much better. So you actually do end up transmitting a fair amount of information, but it's in a in a much more useful and effective way. Yes. Mm -hmm. Students, um, have, you, have you dealt much with student perceptions of these, of uh, teaching, using these you know, new techniques and approaches with group yeah. work and such? And I guess the reason I, one reason I ask that is because so much of our teaching is constrained potentially by student evaluation. Yeah. And so I'm Boy, am I glad you brought that up. If you couldn't hear that, she's, well, she's worrying about student perceptions, and I put in other terms, uh, student resentment, in fact. Mm -hmm. And so, so, yeah, we actually have looked a lot, at, a fair amount about this. And I can tell you several things that are quite important. Um, you first, abs so it's not at all unusual for for there to be some student resentment, uh, people automatically resent anything they're not used to. And so if these students have been seeing this all along, then they resent it. Uh, Eric Mazur, who maybe some of you have 
heard before. I mean, he was just talking about how he's compared his student evaluations and when he, if he follows an instructor who's been using the very traditional lecture type, Eric's, Eric's uh, student evaluations are among the lowest in the department. If he follows an instructor who's been using this peer instruction and highly interactive lecture, his are among the highest in the department. <laughs> so, so, you know, it, it just shows that these things are very preconditioned on what people expect and what they're used to. But we've actually been, I won't say universally successful, but quite successful at, at introducing a lot of new rather substantial differences in classes and we, we there's certain tech things you have to do that can in the hands of a moderate instructor will greatly reduce a resentment in the hands of a good instructor will actually have students quite po you know much po more positive about it um, f number one they have to not be thinking they're being treated as guinea pigs, okay? So you've got to bring them into the process. You've got to talk to them about why you're teaching this way, why, you know, give them a, show them a bunch of data, uh, you know, why you're convinced that they learn more effectively from this. You've got to return to that discussion periodically through the term and give them a chance to raise concerns and address those concerns uh, as to how, what they're learning and why. Um, so so that's, that's, that's pretty much it, really. Uh, but they always have to, they have to see that you're doing this because you're concerned with their learning and that what you're doing is not just your idiosyncratic, bizarre way of teaching, but really based on, you know, other more fundamental things and some data uh, that's behind this. Can I just add one more thing to that? Please? Yeah. Yeah, no, no, that is an important point because, you know, like I said, you can, you can help a lot, but it's still not at all uncommon for the first year or two of changes to, for the evaluations to go down and then they, then they recover. Uh, and so, yeah, the administration and so on has to, has to recognize that as well. Assuming you're talking about introductory science courses as you are, have you found any correlation depending on the mathematical rigor of the subject? Um, now, when you say mathematical rigor, um, do you mean like whether it's physics or biology, or do you mean whether it's first year physics or fourth year physics? Um, well, I said introductory courses, so yeah. it's the first. Okay, so I, I guess probably the best comparison I can give you, this is on what's the relationship of the mathematical rigor of the subject. Um, the best comparison I can give you is uh, we recent, there's lots and lots of data in introductory physics and so on. Uh, we recently at the Colorado Science Education Initiative went through the transformation process of the third year E&M course in physics. Now. I don't know if you're a physicist, but for those, whether you, if you aren't, that is the course in which we really think about this is the time at which students really start having to learn some hardcore mathematics and applying it to physics, you know, sophisticated mathematical problem solving and so on. And so that was designed basically just what I talked about here, and but going through carefully and thinking, okay, what are the within this, you know, sophisticated, rigorous use of mathematics, what are the things experts do and will make those very explicit to the students and so on. And the result was actually, uh, well, it was better, it was surprisingly good. It was a dramatic improvement on, 
on a bunch of different measures of student mastery of these topics. And you know, really, we were applying the same basic principles that had been proven in introductory physics up to something where there was a high level of mathematical rigor, and it seemed to work in just the same way. So uh, that's the best particular uh, empirical comparison I can give you. We, can I but we. One more question. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, class structure at Cornell, we have some introductory and upper level courses that are have an auditorial format which you might think actually allows people more of an opportunity to be the expert thinker and get positive feedback and have a dialogue. I'm wondering if you have any opinion on that. Uh, can you explain to me what more what you, is happening in this course? Okay, so yeah, well, there I'm, is one I'm in not... physics. There's an introductory biology and biochemistry. I don't know if people are here from those courses. <clears throat> Um, the physics one, it's almost like they have access to hands-on labs the entire time. So there are a series of demonstration stations that they go to and they can try out different concepts. And then they have periods, um, they have several experiments that they're supposed to do. And they go and they do the experiments and they write it up in their lab book and then they talk to a TA. And they have specific assigned TAs, but they're allowed to do it in their own time. Mm -hmm. um, they have a series of homework questions that they're supposed to go through and the solutions are available to and then they have a testing center and they're allowed to... Oh, yeah, them. okay, right. This is called uh, something or other, uh, yeah, this, this was big 30 years ago. Got so much work, people stopped using so much. I've forgotten the label on this. Uh, so, uh, the, I mean, this kind of self-paced uh, sort of business, it certainly has some, some features which are attractive to it. I think uh, it, it clearly has some downsides beyond just the resources that's, the resource demand is why a lot of people who started using it don't anymore. But um, I, I think there's no simple answer to whether that's good or bad because it's really within the details of the implementation, the details of what students are doing, they could be learning to memorize, you know, memorizing recipes, etc., or they could be learning good expert thinking. And I think, you know, the, that the format could easily accommodate either. And so I, I don't think it's possible to make a general statement about 